So Tope, you took a different path from many founders when building Calendly, specifically when it came to funding Calendly in the early days, you didn't raise a ton of VC capital right out of the gates. So I guess first question is, how was the business funded if it wasn't through large amounts of VC dollars out of the gates? Yeah, really good question. So I, I had the idea for Calendly in 2012 and by I, and I spent six months really trying to determine if I wanted to pursue the idea or not. Or not. Fast forward to late, early 2013, I decided that I was going to pursue the idea. And once I got to that point, you know, I, I couldn't wait to get started. <clears throat> um, uh, but what I found was really there are not a lot of people who are looking to fund, uh, uh, you know, companies that are still in the idea uh, stage. And I was also trying to find a, um, a technical co-founder that was taking a lot longer um, than I uh, thought it would. And rather than wait for, uh, rather than wait indefinitely, I got anxious and I just, uh, I, uh, I went to my bank account, went to my 401k and that's really how I uh, started Calendly. So it was just really um, my 401k, my life savings, everything I'd ever saved. And I even took out a few loans um, and that really funded the first six, seven months of the company. So this is the product. We start building the product in early 2013. By the fall of 2013, we released the MVP. What also happened at that time is, you know, no sooner had we, you know, had we released the MVP, people started signing up for the product, and um, they were using the product, but they had a lot of different ideas for what the, how the product could be improved. But by that point, I'd actually run out of money, right? So I exhausted my savings, uh, so I had just enough money to release a, uh, to build an MVP. Um, but given the feedback that we were getting from the early users, it was clear there was a lot of opportunity to continue to evolve the product and there was a clear need. Um, and so I went out and raised a seed round from uh, uh, in, in, sorry, in April of 2014 of about 350,000, actually not about exactly 350,000. And then in fast forward to April of 2015, I raised another um, convertible round of about 200K, but really that's, uh, all the company raised, uh, you know, from its inception all the way through until this recent funding event this uh, a few months ago. And so after that point of, of raising, um, you know, funding it through all of your savings, raising um, a small amount of uh, convertible note financing, uh, and then a number of years of, of sort of operating without VC funding from there, how did those number of years uh, play out? Uh, how, how did you fund the business at, at that point? Was it largely from the business itself, from revenue or from other sources? Yes, it was largely from the from the users. So a, a couple of things happened as I <clears throat> as I ran out of money and went to raise those uh, initial rounds. I actually found out that I did not like the process of raising money. Right. So that ended up shaping a bunch of you know, a bunch of decisions in the business. I myself did not enjoy the process of fundraising. The reason I did not is in the early days of the business, it's pre revenue. Uh, you're mostly, you know, the capital. You're mostly raising from probably the, the least, you know, the least professional investors, right? And that process, that you know, experience was not really great for me. Uh, specifically, I, <laughs> I remember really, really, uh, you know, like uh, a very specific experience in which I was looking to, I was talking to this angel investor, and at the time, just from some background here, the initial team that built Calendly was based in Eastern Europe. So I would travel to Eastern Europe to to spend time with them as we're building the product. And I'm in the middle of this fundraise as I'm working with them in, uh, in Kiev specifically. And this one specific person I was looking to meet, I stayed up till 2, 3 a.m. Kiev time after working all day and meet with this person. And at the very, very last minute, um, he stood me up. So, which is just, you know, very, very disappointing for me. All of that to say, I just, I didn't really enjoy the fundraising process. And because of that, once I ended up raising uh, from, you know, David uh, Cummins at Atlanta Ventures, um, I was determined to never raise again, right? So it shifted, it, you know, it ended up uh, it ended up determining my behavior in a lot of ways. What that meant was there was an urgency to, there was an urgency to establish a business model, right? Um, and um, and that's what we ended up doing. So raised the seed round in April of 2014. By August, uh, around August uh, 2014, we decided to uh, introduce a paid plan. In introducing a play, uh, paid plan, we had projections that you know my you know the projections I had at the time were that about one percent of signed up users would convert to paid. Um, it ended up becoming three percent over time over the course of a year or so. It ended up that 
conversion rate actually ended up being three, four X at that, right? So the projections, the performance was actually much better than what the projections were. Um, what also happened is as we began to monetize, it ended up becoming this very, uh, it crystallized the business model and the product strategy and the company strategy in a lot of different ways because we saw the people who were most likely to convert, right? There were very specific roles. Uh, people in very specific roles that were much more likely to convert. And so we ended up optimizing, building our product strategy around uh, around those high converting users. And uh, which is, uh, and so the company became, as a result, uh, you know, through a combination of our product strategy, through a combination of the, you know, sign up to pay ratio being much better than we anticipated, uh, the company became profitable probably within 18 months or so of that. So by, by late, 2016 or so, the company had become cash flow positive, and very soon after that, it actually became uh, EBITDA positive, and uh, that's really how the company has grown since you know 2014 all the way through, um, even till now, right? And digging into um, sort of some of those details, so you know, feeling that urgency to get to the business model, developing the paid plan, seeing the conversion uh, from free to paid, and then seeing that improve over time which then pretty quickly, at least in startup terms, led to a profitable business. Um, I, I was curious what's kind of behind that. And I think that there's a lot um, that really is related to the virality of Calendly and the self-service nature of Calendly. And so maybe we can kind of unpack some of the viral mechanisms of Calendly a little bit and how that leads specifically to, to this profitability. So maybe first off, what is the viral mechanism in Calendly and, and how exactly does it work in the product? Yeah, so very early on, um, you know, what we saw was, you know, going back to, <laughs> you know, late 2013 when we first released the product. Um, one of the things I saw before uh, I decided to, you know, create Calendly was there were a lot of incumbents in the market. Calendly was not, Calendly did not invent automated scheduling. There were a lot of incumbents in the market. And what I noticed was in spite of the fact that they really hadn't done a lot of marketing, they'd been, you know, pretty successful. So there were a lot of reasons to believe that the virality in itself um, was you know was strong enough to propel the business to some amount of growth, um, and then we launched the product. Right, we launched the MVP really before we can even actually. <laughs> the initial users ended up signing up before we were even really ready to um, go out into a public beta, and very quickly, you know, um, without any other advertising channels, right, without any other marketing channels, any other channels to acquire users, um, you know. We went from we were steadily increasing signups every single day. So the virality very, very. So it's one thing before launching the product, we had a thesis that, you know, that this I had a thesis because it was just me at the time that, um, you know, virality could be a, a strong, um, a very, uh, you know, productive user acquisition channel ended up uh, being true. And we saw that very early on. Um, and so in the early days, we actually did not what would happen and still what happens today is. Um, there's really no use. Our users are primarily using Calendly to schedule external meetings, right? And so, the very um, in using the product, they're in, they're you know in the process sharing it with other people. Well, a significant percentage of those people uh, end up loving the experience and saying this is super easy. It's incredibly frictionless. Um, they end up signing up, and then the the loop kind of repeats itself. And so what we saw in the very early days of Calendly was the initial users of the, the very, very first, uh, initial users were actually a customer success managers in a SaaS company. Um, this very specific SaaS company was, was uh, selling to folks in the higher education, uh, sorry, in the K through 12 education space. Um, so customer success schedules with people in the K through 12 space. Those people then turned around and started using the product for parent teacher conferences. And so in the early days of Calendly, um, we started seeing you know a lot of uh, uptake among uh, educators and then eventually spread to many other different sectors and many different roles. But all of that happened without really uh, any deliberate um, effort on our part. Seeing this uh, play out, we then started um, optimizing that flow. So before, in the early days of Calendly, um, a recipient would schedule, but really there were no prompts to say, hey, do you want to check this out and uh, use a product yourself? Once we saw that that was actually happening, we then began to experiment with that. We then made a deliberate effort to convert those recipients of the scheduling link um, into Calendly users themselves. 
So um, that, that was a question I was going to ask, um, which is, is virality this kind of binary thing that it, either you have it or you don't have it, it's on or it's off, or is it something that can be kind of improved over time through the efforts of, you know, your product team or a growth team or, or a marketing team amplifying it? Um, and so you pointed to some of those you know, running experiments and seeing the virality uh, increase over time. Any specific examples or sort of pro tips for folks looking to enhance their own virality? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what I can uh, what I can share is what my own experience with Calendly. And, you know, as I decompose really what happened with Calendly and how Calendly was able to grow uh, primarily through the uh, through its virality, there are three things I think, uh, you know, uh, ingredients to that success. One is that the, is sharing is just inherent in the usage of the product, right? And so Calendly has this element. There's no uh, there's no single player mode, if you will. There's no way to use a product without um, collaborating with somebody else. So Calendly has this dy dynamic. Zoom has this dy dynamic. Um, uh, Zoom, Zoom has this dynamic. Dropbox has has it for a lot of use cases. Uh, there are uh, many others that do. And then the second part is the large, large addressable market, right? You know, there are many other products in which you can't use without sharing with others, uh, but then you know maybe the addressable market of that product is actually not really um, large. So a really good example would be if you are, it, say you're a dentist and you're using a scheduling platform and you're using that for your, you know, you're uh, you're using that for your pa you're using that for your for patient scheduling. Well, significant number of your patients aren't really dentists themselves. So if you are if you are uh, you know, if there's a vertical specific, you know, scheduling product, you know, the virality is just not as great because the addressable market is much smaller. And then I think the third thing that I think led to Calendly success is the ability to capitalize or convert that interest into, into users of the product so that that loop uh, kind of perpetuates. Uh, and, and so for us, the, you know, by nature of the, of the product and what it does, the, you know, the, the inherent virality is there. The number of people who need to schedule external meetings is massive. It's in the hundreds of millions. Uh, check, you know, when we check that box. And then the third thing we really focused on is how can we continue to optimize those those different viral surface areas, right? So anytime Calendly is, um, anytime somebody receives Calendly, what are the different ways in which they're receiving it? Or through emails, um, through emails that we send out, through different pages on the web, whether uh, actually going into scheduling. And then we're really optimizing every single one of those acquisition channels. We're looking at how can we reduce friction, right? So that we can improve the conversion there. We're also looking at where do we deliberately add friction? Because some of the things we saw is um, there are lots of different experience, experiments that you can do that actually improve the conversion rate of the people who receive a link into users. But then the difficult part is how do you actually activate those users, right? So that the so that the loop continues to uh, perpetuate. That part is a lot harder, right? And uh, and so we look at not only you know can we get the recipients into users, but how can we get them into activated users who are users who are using the product and perpetuating that loop? Uh, those are some of the things that we've done. And then I think the third, uh, I guess, yeah, another ingredient is just really product strategy. Seeing and seeing this play play out, we realized that there was a, you know, we really wanted to make the product a uh, frictionless uh, to use. And we really, um, you know, when I look at, I guess, when I compare the Calendly strategy to some of the incumbents in the market, one of the things I think Calendly did very differently is really uh, to democratize the experience, right? So we really optimize the product experience for people who had never used automated scheduling before, people who didn't think they would even need automated scheduling. And I think is that you take a very different approach if that's your audience, as opposed to um, as opposed to those users who already uh, who are scheduling 100 meetings a week, for example, and already understand the value of um, automated scheduling. So those are the I think those are some of the things that we did, uh, and I would encourage those. Uh, who are thinking about um, who are thinking about how they can use virality as a um, as a strategy to consider? Yeah, what, one of the big things you just said that that jumped out to me was that it's almost kind of this litmus test: is can you use this product in single player mode, um, or is it inherently viral? Does there need to be somebody on the other side of it? Um, you know, Calendly. You know, you can't schedule a meeting with yourself. <laughs> there has to be somebody on the other side. 
you know, Zoom, you, you mentioned that example, you can't host a Zoom by yourself. There has to be somebody on the other side. Um, there are many other examples though, and, and you know, a lot of ones that, that I will look for is, you know, where are there perhaps maybe less obvious examples? Um, and, and one that I like to, to sort of point to is, uh, is actually expense reports. Uh, Cause mm. I work with the team over at Expensify and it's uh, it's an example where it's not maybe as obviously viral um, when, when you just look at it on the surface, but when you think about it, you know, somebody is building their expense report um, and in Expensify's case, taking pictures of receipts, and then they have to submit it to somebody else. Um, that somebody else sits in finance um, and then ultimately approves or disapproves of, of the report and then gets the reimbursement sent back to you. So the viral loop is a little bit different. It's not this inherently, you know, sort of asynchronous or synchronous uh, communication product, but there still is a lot of virality there. And I think, um, you know, looking for those opportunities in your product, um, there's virality and there's loops and there's collaboration hooks everywhere. Um, you know, it really can be this accelerant towards growth and accelerant towards profitable growth as, as you've seen in, in Calendly. Um, I, I guess it does lead me to one other question, which is a lot of this is being automated by the product itself. Um, and what's the role of, of human effort? You know, do salespeople get involved in a viral funnel? Um, do success people get involved in a viral funnel? What have you seen there? Yeah, um, you're right. I think the most obvious, uh, you know, the most obvious ways to amplify virality is through the product. Um, but for us, we don't think it stops there. We actually think you know, humans play a huge role in amplifying that. You know, some very sp specific examples for us uh, would be our customer success team, for example. Um, we, as a as a as a freemium product, most freemium products, um, you know, as a freemium product, one of the things that we we do is actually provide email support to every single Calendly user, right? And uh, not only do we provide email support, we provide it in a very timely fashion for a free product. Um, you know, even free users are very surprised when they submit a ticket and they get a response back within 10 minutes, right? The reason we do that is because we realize that ultimately somebody is sending in a ticket and the reason they're sending a ticket is they have an issue and that issue is a barrier to, to scheduling meetings, right? So the sooner we can get back to those people, the sooner they can, they can actually schedule the meeting the, and the more they're contributing to this, uh, to this virality. It also happens that it's just really good uh, business and just a really, really good way to support your uh, your users and your customers. So we see providing speedy support to our users as one, making them succeed, allows them to be successful and also powers the, the viral loop that makes us all successful. So um, we see that, we see that as a win-win um, one. And then in the cost, on the customer success side, we were doing more or less the same thing. So we're not only thinking about how do we, how do we onboard a user or a trial, sorry, a user that's going through a trial. We're really, really thinking about that through the entire journey as a, as a user, as a customer, right? Our onboarding, sorry, everything from onboarding review, uh, onboarding calls to, to quarterly reviews, we're really thinking about how can we, uh, you know, if you think about the teams that are using Calendly, uh, they're using, the teams that are using Calendly are those in which their success depends on the quality and quantity of external meetings they were getting. And so um, our North Star, the North Star for all those teams is how can we, um, how can we help them do more of that? And in closing here, curious uh, what advice you might have for founders who find themselves in the same shoes that you were in a handful of years ago, which is, I don't like fundraising. I think I want to take a different path. I think I want to bootstrap um, or, or be minimally financed. W what advice would you give to, to founders in that position? W what do you know now that you wish you knew then? Yeah. Um, so one, I think that, you know, Founders who are thinking about taking the bootstrap path are, uh, I'm glad that I took the bootstrap path because I think if it, it uh, exercised some muscles that I think have really, really um, allowed Calendly to be successful, just a maniacal obsession with the customer and the user. And also uh, doing that while also really prioritizing uh, finding an effective and scalable business model, right? So I think all those things are good. But what I also know now is that the journey to build a, you know, an enduring company is a very long and difficult one. And I think you need as many allies um, as you can throughout that journey. And so I believe the best, you know, the best uh, entrepreneurs and founders are those who are in it for the long haul. And if your goal is to be in it for the long haul, you just need a lot of allies along that, you know, al you know along that journey. And uh, the sooner you can have them um, on your team, uh, the better. What I also know now is that, um, you know, the, you know, VCs and private equity have never been more entrepreneur uh, friendly, right? So I think a lot of founders who are bootstrapped 
uh, you know, the reason the reason not to bootstrap, sorry, the reason not to take on capitals, you know, people fear that they'll lose control of their business. Um, the reality is I think they'll find that they can maintain, you know, they can protect their vision and also get the help um, that will help them uh, de-risk their path and uh, ensure um, enduring success. Well, Tope, congrats on what you've built and thanks for sharing the journey with us. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure.